Alyssa, are you good to go? Hi, yes, I'm ready. Great. Okay. So I want to welcome everybody here today. My name is Carolyn Dubay. I'm the Executive Director with Fertility Matters Canada. I am thrilled to welcome everybody here. We are live on Zoom and also on Facebook. So whatever platform you're joining us from, please uh, know that we're thankful that you're here. And we're really, really excited to um, have such an amazing lineup this week during Canadian Infertility Awareness Week. Um, of professionals in the fertility industry to bring you the information and resources you need to make informed decisions about your reproductive health. And I'm really happy today that we're speaking with Alyssa Magwood. She is from Access Genomics and she's going to talk to us about pre-implantation genetic testing. We get a lot of questions in our office for patients who are wondering not only what it is, but is it worth it? Um, and we're going to talk about some of those things today. So I'm thrilled, Alyssa. Thank you for being here. And I can't wait uh, for you to share with us um, all of your knowledge. Take it away. Hey, thanks, Carolyn. Um, and thanks to everybody at Fertility Matters, to Vidya and Darlene, and of course to you, Carolyn, um, not only for having me here today, but for the amazing support that you give to everyone um, that is struggling with fertility across Canada. And in keeping with the theme of Canadian Infertility Awareness Week, I want to let each and every one of you know that we see you. At Access Genomics, we see you. And we see the difficult journey that you're going through, um, whatever stage you may be at in that journey. We know that there are a lot of questions, uh, as Carolyn alluded to that, uh, around genomic testing, whether it's right for you or not. And at Access Genomics, we are Canadian. We're the only Canadian owned and operated genomics company that focuses on fertility and reproductive health. And we're here to help. We're here to hopefully provide some clarity for you. Pick up the phone and call us, uh, email us, reach out to us on our website. Uh, we'd be happy to help you. So we see you and we hear you. And with that, I wanna jump right in to talking to you today about uh, pre-implantation genetic testing. <laughs> oh, here we go. Okay, so I want to talk to you about what genetic testing does and doesn't do. And right off the bat, I have to tell you that genetic testing does not fix any genetic problems. We uh, scientists, Access Genomics, we cannot repair or fix genetic problems that you may have or that your, your child might have or your, your embryo might have. But what genetic testing can do is it can identify what is present and it can help with making those difficult decisions. So uh, we have to get some housekeeping things out of the way first before we get into uh, the details, but uh, it's important to talk about um, human genomics. So as humans, most of the cells in our body have 46 chromosomes. We have one set of 23 that came from our mother via the egg and one set of 23 that came from our fathers via the sperm. And you can see that in the diagram on, on the right-hand side of the screen. Chromosomes contain genes, hundreds, hundreds and thousands of them. And those genes contain DNA. And that is all the genetic information we need to grow and develop. So when we talk about genomics, we're actually talking about the study of the complete set of chromosomes. When we're talking about genetics, we're talking about specific genes. Um, however, we tend to use those two terms, genetics and genomics, sort of interchangeably. Uh, some other terminology that we need to get out of the way that, are, that will be important uh, in talking about pre-implantation genetic testing. A uh, euploid. A euploid cell is a normal cell. It's a cell that has two copies of each chromosome. So it's normal. It has 46 in total. And you can remember that euploid uh, stands for excellent. The E, euploid, excellent. Aneuploid, on the other hand, is a cell that has the wrong number of chromosomes. It's either, it either has extra chromosomes or it's missing some chromosomes. And you can remember that because the A of aneuploid indicates it's abnormal. And then we have a third type, uh, and that's called mosaicism. And basically, mosaicism means a mix. So in the case of what we're discussing today, it's a mix of both euploid and aneuploid, a mix of normal and abnormal. And again, that M can help you remember that it means mixed, or in the case of IVF, it's a maybe. So what do these three words, these three types of results mean for IVF embryos? Well, over the last um, approximately 20-ish years, 15 to 20 years, um, we've learned that a euploid embryo, a completely normal embryo that has 46 chromosomes in every cell, has the best chance of implanting and creating a, a, a healthy baby. 
And that live birth rate is somewhere between the range of 40 to 60% and higher. On the other hand, your aneuploid results or your aneuploid abnormal embryos that have the wrong number of chromosomes have a basically a zero chance of creating a healthy live baby. And then you have your mosaics, your mixes, and those embryos fall somewhere in the middle. They're sort of in that gray zone and the published um, live birth rate is around 15 to 40%. So it's important that we all realize that aneuploidy is very, very common in human reproduction. It's not just an IVF problem. Uh, in fact, human reproduction is incredibly inefficient. When a sperm fertilizes an egg, up to 60% of the time, nothing happens. There's no pregnancy. Uh, the embryo might, or the egg might become fertilized, uh, start to grow, but won't implant. Or it could implant, but then die really early. In both of those scenarios, you never know because you just don't get pregnant. Sometimes abnormal and aneuploid embryos do implant, and we know that this is the most common cause of miscarriage. Uh, greater than 90% of the aneuploidy that we see is due to errors in eggs, and this increases dramatically with maternal age. So this is some data from Access Genomics. And if you look along the bottom, you'll see that we have um, the data grouped by maternal age. So on the far left, we've got our egg donors, our really young women. Then we've got our women that are under the age of 35. Then we've got our 35 to seven year olds, 38 to 40 year olds, and then our um, greater than 40 year old population. And what you see here is that as women get older, the number of abnormal aneuploid embryos that they have or that they create through IVF dramatically increases with maternal age. And of course, their euploid embryos go down as they get older. So why is this? Where does this aneuploidy come from? Well, the issue is that as women, we are born with all the eggs we're ever going to have. And throughout our life, our eggs are exposed to all sorts of damaging agents. And most of these are unavoidable. Things like fevers, infections, stress, toxins, chemicals, et cetera, et cetera. And these damaging agents cause damage to our DNA, and that results in chromosomal aneuploidy. Now, that's not to say sperm are without problems. They're not. You can have aneuploid sperm as well. But the difference is that sperm are produced continuously in the testes. And therefore, because they're being remade all the time and new sperm are being made, they're exposed to far less DNA damage than eggs are. So how is IVF different um, than you know, natural human reproduction? Well, in IVF, eggs are fertilized with sperm in the lab, and they grow and they develop into embryos in the lab. In fact, they grow for about five to six days before they're transferred back into the uterus. And in IVF, embryologists have no way of looking at this, you know, these growing and developing embryos and knowing which ones are euploid or normal, and which ones are aneuploid or abnormal. They all look the same. So this is where pre-implantation genetic testing for aneuploidy comes into the picture. What PGTA does is it looks at IVF embryos and it determines which ones are euploid, which ones are normal, and therefore have the best chance of implantation and a healthy baby. So this is an example, a graphic, of what the PGTA process roughly looks like. So I mentioned that an embryo develops in an IVF lab for about five or six days. And you can see a schematic diagram here of that sort of development process. So once an embryo reaches day five or day six of development, it's developed into what we call a blastocyst. And it's made up of an outer layer of cells that's called the trophectoderm. This is going to become the placenta. And inside, there's a mass of cells called the inner cell mass. And this is the developing baby. So for PGTA, at the blastocyst stage, your embryologist will take a small biopsy of about four to six cells from the trophectoderm layer, not from the inner cell mass, the developing baby, from the trophectoderm layer. They take that small biopsy and then they freeze all of your embryos. Most uh, IVF labs now in Canada and around the world do freeze all for all of their embryos, whether they're doing PGTA testing or not. So your embryo will be frozen that biopsy is then sent to a genetic testing lab, such as Access Genomics. We get that biopsy on site, and basically what we do then is we count the chromosomes in a roundabout way. And we determine how many copies of each chromosome are there from each sample, from each biopsy. And then we create a report that tells your IVF team and your IVF clinic 
which of the embryo biopsies we received are normal, euploid, and which ones are abnormal. And then that information is used by your team to decide which embryo has the best chance of implanting and resulting in a pregnancy and a healthy baby. So it stands to reason then that some of the benefits that we see of PGTA is that it provides the shortest path to a single live birth. You've got a decreased risk of failed transfers because you know you're armed with the knowledge that you're transferring a euploid embryo, the embryo that has the best chance of implanting. Of course, the risk of miscarriage is then decreased and your chance of a healthy baby is increased. If you're lucky enough to have a number of screened euploid embryos, it also provides options for future implantations. So I've already talked briefly about mosaicism, but I wanna talk about it a little bit more now because it really is kind of a hot topic um, and it's generated a lot of attention um, in the last say like year or so. So what about mosaicism? Well, basically, as I alluded to before, mosaicism is the presence of more than one type of cell population. So in the case of um, PGTA, we're talking about a mix of euploid and aneuploid cells. So how does this happen in IVF or in embryos? Well, most likely when the sperm fertilizes the egg, both of them are normal. They have the right number of chromosomes. But in that cell division that happens in the first five to six days uh, in an IVF lab, that cell division is ridiculously fast. In fact, the embryo has to shut off its DNA repair machinery to allow the cell division to happen that rapidly. And sometimes what can happen is an error, a DNA error, replication error can happen in a cell. And as the cell division continues to happen rapidly, that error is propagated, it's spread as the embryo continues to grow and develop and divide. And of course, then what you get is an embryo that has some normal cells, but some abnormal cells as well. So basically when a biopsy, a trifectoderm biopsy is taken of an embryo like this, uh, theoretically, the biopsy will contain a mix of normal and abnormal cells and can lead to a mosaic result. So the technology that we use for PGTA testing is, uh, is called NGS, it's Next Generation Sequencing. It is extremely uh, advanced. It is much more powerful than any of its predecessor technologies. In fact, NGS can reliably detect mosaicism in a sample down to about as little as 20%. So if you think about that, if, if we receive a biopsy of five cells, if only even one of them is abnormal, we can see that and we can report on it. The issue is that for many years, mosaic embryos were actually considered to be abnormal. People didn't understand what it meant, that, that mosaic result. They didn't understand, uh, and we're still learning, but they just, they, they were better, they wanted to be better safe than sorry, and so they were just designated as aneuploid. Uh, that's changing because we know now, based on the heavy global research that's happening, that these mosaic embryos are, they shouldn't be labeled aneuploid. Uh, we should report on the mosaicism that we see, and we should, with careful genetic counseling, um, help patients make the best decisions about these embryos. And so I alluded to this global research. Um, at Access Genomics, we feel incredibly passionate about staying up to date and on top of all of the most latest research in our field, but particularly around mosaics. Um, there's a lot of research um, around which of these embryos have the best chance of a healthy baby. Does it depend on which chromosomes are involved? Well, probably it does. Um, the percent of aneuploidy, it makes sense that if your, your sample is 70% abnormal and only has 30% normal cells, perhaps the outcome won't be as good as a, uh, an embryo that may have 30% abnormal and 70% normal and so on and so forth. So in PGTA, uh, when you get a result back that says that your sample was mosaic, what that really means is that we saw an intermediate copy number change. And I'm going to explain that for you. But basically, it means that rather than a full gain of, a, of an entire chromosome or a full loss, we're seeing something in the middle. So this is some data uh, from Access Genomics from a PGTA uh, sample. And basically, if you look along the bottom, you'll see the numbers 1 to 22. So that represents 22 chromosomes. In Canada, we do not report on the sex chromosomes on X and Y unless there's something wrong with them. So we, we have to remove them. We can't use gender as a means for PGTA. So this is showing you chromosomes 1 to 22. And basically what we've done is we've counted the, cop the copy numbers for each one of these chromosomes in this sample. And what you can see is that in this sample, there's two copies. 
of every one of the chromosomes. So this is a euploid sample. In contrast, we've got an aneuploid result here. So there are two copies of most of the chromosomes, but in chromosome 16, we clearly see that all of the cells that we tested had only one copy of chromosome 16. So this is an aneuploid result. We know that the chance of this embryo implanting and resulting in a healthy baby is slim to none. And this is an example of what I meant by an intermediate copy number change. This is a mosaic result. So in this particular sample, if you look at uh, chromosome nine right here, you can see that what we're seeing is a result that's somewhere in between. It's in between two copies and three copies. It's a mosaic result. And same with uh, chromosome 15. We're seeing a loss here, but it's not a full copy loss. It's an intermediate loss. It's somewhere between one copy and two copies. So this is an example of a mosaic result. So at Access Genomics, we report embryos that have anywhere from 30 to 70% of aneuploid cells. We call those mosaic. And we give that information. We tell you which chromosomes are involved. We show you every one of our reports includes the picture that I just showed you. So you can understand and, and see it for yourself. And we tell you, of course, which chromosomes involved and the percentage of the approximate percentage uh, that we're seeing. For all the talk and the attention that mosaicism garners, it's important to note that it's not really that common. Uh, we see about 10% of our samples as mosaic and that aligns really well with the global literature that I'm gonna share with you in a minute. Um, and probably more importantly, the percentage of patients that only have mosaic embryos to consider is low. It's around 4%. Regardless, what do you do if you get uh, a mosaic result and this is uh, your option and the only thing you have available to you? Um, we recommend that all patients talk to our genetic counselor, our team of genetic counselors. They are incredibly well-versed on mosaicism. They stay up to date on the latest information and they can give you um, phenomenal genetic counseling so that you are extremely well informed to make a decision about your mosaic embryo. Okay, so now I wanna move on to uh, the keys to success for PGTA. And this might surprise you because didn't I just tell you that uh, it basically comes down to maternal age and aneuploidy? Well, yes, that's true, but there are some other very important factors. And it might surprise you to learn that the PGTA success actually starts right in your IVF lab. The techniques and the procedures, the overall quality of the IVF lab has a huge impact on the success. It's really important that you, uh, when you're looking for an IVF clinic or a, a center, you need to ask these questions. This is crucial. Um, you need to determine the quality of the IVF lab that you're going to. So you can ask questions like these. You're, you can find answers to such questions as, what's their fertilization rate? Um, how many eggs fertilize in their hands? Uh, how many embryos survive to day five or day six? How many embryos make it to that blastocyst stage? And that's called the blastulation rate. What's the survival rate of thawed embryos? So I mentioned that uh, across Canada, the, the vast majority of IVF centers do what's called freeze all. We freeze all of those embryos. And the reason for that is we know that uh, transferring an embryo back into a woman's natural cycle has the best chance uh, for success. But what's their survival rate? Um, are they good at, at freezing and at thawing embryos? It's crucial and really and truly it should be 99% or better. So ask these questions. What's the euploidy rate of that IVF lab? What's their mosaicism rate? And I'm gonna show you some data of, of why that matters. Um, and importantly, how, if you're considering PGTA, how many biopsies does uh, your IVF center perform in a week? It makes good sense that the more skilled they are, this is not a simple procedure. This is, a, it's, it's a very technically challenging. Um, they need to be really good at it. The more they do, the better they would be. So uh, ask to speak to the IVF lab director at your clinic, get the answers to these questions and put a lot of thought into choosing a clinic. The clinic that's closest to you might not be your best option. The next thing you need to consider uh, in your keys to success is what happens to your uh, samples? Like what happens once these embryos are biopsied? Your embryos are frozen and they stay safe in your IVF lab, but what about the biopsies? How long are they kept in the IVF lab freezer before they're sent to, to the genetic testing lab? Um, where are they sent? 
Do they have to go on an airplane? Are they a local courier? Do they go cross border? Um, how are they shipped? All of these things make a difference and they can negatively impact your PGTA results. And then of course you need to pay attention to the genetic testing lab. What kind of technology is the genetic testing lab using? Um, I mentioned that next generation sequencing really is the gold standard. How does that genetic testing lab secure your data? Um, do you have genetic counseling available? There's all of these things to consider. So now down to the real crux. Why does all of this information matter? So last year, at the end of last year, there was a large uh, clinical trial published called the STAR trial. And the STAR trial uh, was a global trial from across the world. It looked at 34 different IVF clinics and nine different genetic testing labs. And it looked at uh, basically the success of PGTA in, uh, across these 34 centers. What this graph shows you right here are the top 12 IVF centers that reported into the STAR data. So these, top, these clinics uh, sent the largest numbers of biopsies. Look at the difference in their euploidy rates. You've got some centers that are up around 60% of their euploidy rates, and you've got some that are down like 20%. And I'm going to tell you why this matters, and I'm going to come back to this. But I mentioned that uh, there's all kinds of factors that can cause uh, DNA damage in cells. Things like stimulation protocols, uh, media, temperature, culture conditions, all of these things in your IVF lab, they can affect the genetics. So this next graph is basically the same data I just showed you, but this time I'm showing you the nine different genetic testing labs that were involved in the STAR trial. And you can see that same huge variability in euploidy rate. And I've superimposed uh, the euploidy rate that we see at Access Genomics. So I mentioned we're a Canadian uh, genomics provider and we work with Canadian IVF labs. So I think this uh, speaks really highly to the quality of IVF labs across Canada. You can see that the euploidy rate that we see is very, very good, but you can certainly see the range that is possible. And then finally, mosaicism. Uh, mosaicism may perhaps be the factor that is most influenced by lab quality. So this graph is not from the STAR trial. This is from uh, a study that was uh, published at ESHRI last year in 2019. And this is looking at 21 different IVF clinics. And all of these clinics were using the same genetics testing lab. It's not Access Genomics. This was in Europe. Look at the variation in mosaicism from clinic to clinic. It is astounding. Again, I have superimposed um, the, uh, the mosaicism rate that we see at Access Genomics there. We're around 10%. And that is, again, reflective of the very high quality of Canadian IVF clinics and labs. Uh, but you can see here how different protocols, different culture conditions, different, um, you know, there's so many different factors. They can really impact your results. So even though, I mean, if you're in Canada, um, and I have said that the quality in Canada is fantastic. When you compare us globally, it's true, but you still need to ask the questions because there still is clinic to clinic variation. Okay, so uh, we've talked a lot about PGTA, what it is, um, you know, factors that can influence it. Well, let's come down to who, who should consider PGTA. And Carolyn alluded to this, that people ask all the time if fertility matters, you know, because it's, it, it is expensive. It's not, uh, it's not without cost. Um, so who should consider it? I just want to remind you again of the benefits of PGTA. So what we see in our patients that do PGTA, we see decreased failed transfers and decreased miscarriages. We see an increased chance of a healthy baby and we do see uh, the shortest time to baby. Uh, so basically if these benefits are uh, important to you, then you should consider PGTA and, and get more information and ask more questions. But it's especially recommended for people of advanced reproductive age, so people that are 35 and older. And that's simply because we know that as you reach the age of 35 and, and you know, continue on in, in years, that your rate of aneuploidy, the number of abnormal embryos, increases. If you have a history of previous unsuccessful IVF cycles, a history of repeat miscarriage, if you have a known history of chromosomal um, abnormalities yourself or in a previous child, we would certainly recommend PGTA for you. So uh, in closing, before we have a chit chat and, and I answer some questions, um, 
PGTA is not for everyone. It isn't. Um, it's a very personal and, um, and in an independent decision and choice. And it very well may not change uh, the end result. You might get from point A to point B in the exact same uh, start and end point, but what it might do for you is change how you get there. Um, I, I like this analogy of going out on a trip um, and maybe we can all relate to that because we can't go anywhere <laughs> these days because of COVID-19. But imagine that you're going on a trip. Two cars set off on this trip. They're both driving to the same location. One car has a beautiful, uneventful trip. They get there in whatever time it takes and they reach their destination. Car B, on the other hand, um, perhaps has car troubles along the way. Maybe they get into a fender bender, uh, get stuck at the border. I don't know, a million different things could happen. They still get to the end result. But imagine what the journey is like for the occupants of those two cars. So that's what I mean about uh, PGTA. It may not change um, your, where you get to at the end of the day, but how you get there is what PGTA might be able to help with. So with that said, Carolyn, I'm gonna turn it over to you and I would love to talk, um, kind of have a more, I didn't, I hope that wasn't too formal, but it's hard to talk about a lot of that stuff without showing some pictures and, and some visuals, but, um, yeah, I yeah those the visuals were very, very important. I think that that made all the difference, it made all the difference for me, that's for sure. Um, so I'm sure for other people, you can appreciate getting that understanding. Um, Alyssa, we've got lots of questions that have come Great. in, so I'm very excited about awesome. that. Okay, I, I don't know if you want to. Yeah, I'll stop the screen share. Yeah, stop that. your screen and then you and I can chat. And then if you have to pull that back up, then we can do that. How does that sure. work? Yeah, sounds good. Great, so we've got lots of questions that have come in uh, through Facebook. Um, here is one. How often do fertility clinics decide to transfer mosaic embryos? Will the patient always be notified? And does the rush change depending on the amount of mosaicism or fragments that are mosaic? Mm, okay, so every clinic has a different policy. So it's important, that's another, and I didn't actually mention that, but that is a really important, another question to ask at your clinic. Um, last year, I heard a report, now it will be over a year old now, but they did a survey of 100 IVF clinics in the US and something like 80% of them were not reporting mosaics. But then when you survey the same, the patients attending all of those clinics, like 90% of them wanted to know if they have mosaics. So it's very important to ask at your IVF clinic if they report mosaics because at Access Genomics, we do give clinics that option. We can report mosaicism the way we like, we prefer to do it um, and be very transparent about what we see, the chromosomes involved, the percentage affected, or we can just call them aneuploid. So you need to ask at your clinic what their um, policy is. Uh, some clinics have a policy of no mosaic embryo transfers. Again, you need to ask at your clinic. Other clinics um, with informed genetic counseling and informed consent would absolutely consider it for patients. So you really do need to ask those questions. Uh, what was the second part, Carolyn? Does, um, <clears throat> um, <I> mean rush. <laughs> does the rush change depending on the amount of mosaic, mosaicism or what fragments are mosaic? Maybe they mean result. But maybe, does the rush change depending? Well, okay, so I think his, and maybe this, if, if this doesn't answer the question to whoever asked it, please um, don't hesitate to reach back out by yeah. method to us. But uh, basically the way it, when in mosaicism, like so when NGS kind of took over as the main technology that was being used for PGTA and we started to really see um, true mosaic results and what they meant, uh, they, there was an, an old way of sort of classifying them as low level, which theoretically was 40% or less and then high level, which was 40% or more. So some clinics had a policy that they wouldn't transfer higher level mosaics, where other clinics had a policy that they would, you know, they would consider any option. So, um, so technically, yes, the, so we do, we do report the percent of mosaicism that we see, um, but to be perfectly honest with you, the jury's still out. Um, some people believe that it doesn't matter that that's not the key, that the percent that's there doesn't really matter, that perhaps the more important thing is what chromosome uh, is affected. Um, so, and then there's other studies that seem to show a correlation where your 
um, higher your higher level mosaics maybe don't do as well as your lower level. So the jury is still out. This is it's it's a really amazing and fascinating field because of the amount of research that's going on, the amount of data that comes out every week. Um, it's important that you're working with a clinic. In my opinion, it's important that you're working with a clinic that's on top of this data, that knows the latest information, um, because mosaic embryos are not a no. They aren't. And for patients that only have mosaics to consider, I think it's really uh, a travesty if they aren't well counseled and then um, given the opportunity to make a decision. So I hope that answered the question. Yeah, I, so that the person that responded that yes, you did answer their question. It okay. was, was do the, does the risk change? Oh, the risk, okay. Yes. Yeah. So, um, the, so yeah. Oh, did you wanna go answer that? No, okay. So maybe let's talk about, um, you mentioned something interesting when you said they want to be counseled. So who would counsel a patient on the report? For example, would they see a genetic counselor? Would they see the lab director? Would this be their doctor? Yep. That's a really good question. Uh, and that, again, it really depends from clinic to clinic. So at Access Genomics, we feel really passionate about helping patients understand their report. Um, I've been at a few patient events. The Canadian Fertility Show in Toronto is one that happens every year. And I have a lot of patients that come to me and they come to our booth uh, at Access Genomics and they show me their cell phones and they hold them up and they say, what does this mean? And they're showing me a report that they received from their um, clinic and whatever genetic testing lab that clinic uses and they have no clue what it means. Um, and I think that's uh, tragic. <laughs> We really try with our reports at Access Genomics to make it very clear. So as I mentioned, we do include um, the actual data, the graph with every sample, because I think it helps to understand what we see. It, uh, it gives that sort of credibility to the result. Like you can look at, you can look at sample two and say, yeah, I can see there actually are three copies of chromosome two. Uh, and it is aneuploid and I believe it and I understand what that means. Um, but so with that, you know, if you're armed with that kind of knowledge in a report like that, I think that, uh, you know, your REI or, or even the nursing team that's well-versed and well-educated on PGTA can share that information with you. Um, I can only speak for Access Genomics. I don't know about other genomic testing companies, but we do offer genetic counseling to anyone. Uh, even if you haven't done PGTA yet, you can do a genetic counseling session with our counselors to ex they'll explain Basically, I, I, I'm well versed, but I'm not, a, I'm not a genetic counselor by trade. So, but the genetic counselors will walk you through the process. They'll talk to you about it, the, the pluses and the minuses, the pro, you know, the pros and the cons. And, and they are also available to talk to any patient about their PGTA results. Now, some clinics, I know that there are some clinics across Canada that do have on staff genetic counselors. So presumably in those clinics, you, you have access to their counselors too, but, um, yeah, I think that it's super, super important to understand what your results mean. And if you don't understand, um, ask and get to the, get, you know, you, you have to self-advocate. <clears throat> Absolutely. I think a lot of patients after watching this video will feel much more confident in asking and um, speaking with their REIs or fertility specialists about, <clears throat> about you know, the testing and, and accessing the testing and whether or not it's appropriate for them. Yeah, so. I hope so. And there, because there's a lot of, like anything, you can Google and there's a lot of confusing information. There's a lot of misinformation. Um, so yeah, it's really important to check your source, uh, get a reliable source. And yeah, I think genetic counselors are by far, and especially genetic counselors that specialize in this kind of thing. And that's, that's the beauty of the team that we work with at Access. We have a dedicated team that they counsel on PGTA exclusively. They have worked, the platform that we're using at Access Genomics, they've worked with this platform for years. They're extremely knowledgeable. And I think that's really important too, because you know, and I've talked with patients about this, that when you show me a report from company ABC, I don't know a lot about their, their platform and what they've done and the technology they're using. And so it, it gets hard to, to discuss those details, but. Sure. This is a, an interesting question. Does the doctor know the gender or is it completely withheld? 
Uh, another great question. No, we legally, the genetic reference lab cannot share the gender. So we, we get it, of course, when we run that, when we run the sequencing at Access Genomics, we see the gender, we remove it. So we don't, the doctor doesn't know it at all. Um, we completely have to take it off. The only, the only caveat to that is if there is uh, aneuploidy in either the X or the Y chromosome, or there is, uh, if now something we didn't talk about today, but there's another type of pre-implantation genetic testing, um, and it's for single gene diseases. It used to be called PGD. Uh, when you're doing PGD, so for example, let's say I'm going to use cystic fibrosis as an example. So a single gene disorder, as a, as a parent, you're affected or you're a carrier. So we would do PGD. We would be able to tell you if not only the embryos are euploid or aneuploid, but whether they are affected with cystic fibrosis or not. So some of those disorders <clears throat> are sex linked. So that's another um, example where we would be able or we would disclose gender if we are trying to prevent um, the spread of a sex linked genetic condition. Okay, great information there. Um, I do have a question that I thought for myself. Um, if you already have frozen embryos, can you do a PGTA test on those? Great question. We get that question a lot. Um, and the, the short answer is very clinic dependent. Uh, some clinics do not do it um, and because it's not without risk. Um, we discussed already that all of these, everything that happens in an IVF lab uh, requires tremendous skill. And every, uh, like, you know, a biopsy, a freezing, fine, those are things are not without risk. Now, at the best and highest quality IVF centers, the risk is nil, very, very low. But it's not without risk. So we do, we do work with several clinics that will do it and are confident at thawing, biopsying, and then refreezing. It can be done. But again, you need to ask at your IVF clinic because... Um, some, I know some clinics don't do it just for, for safety. For sure. It sounds like it's a very, the th I know, depending on the, th the freezing systems that people use and if they're cryopreserved or not. So yes, I can imagine yes. that that's very risky mm -hmm. um, and definitely something you'd want to discuss. The pros yeah. and cons with so again, patient. that's a great point too, that it's, it is very, it's very patient specific. You know, we, uh, we've had cases where <clears throat> you, that's an example. You're, you've done, you know, all the rounds of IVF you're ever going to do. You've already have two children and you really would like a third. And this is your kind of last shot at it. Right. And so it's a question of, do I, I'm, tr I'm trying to think of an example that would make good sense. Let's say you have five embryos. Do you sequentially transfer one, two, three, four, five, and try to see, or do you thaw them and test all five and see what you have? And then it's just such a personal and uh, patient de dependent choice. Um, and what, and you know, it comes, you know, we talk about PGTA too. We've, we've talked with patients that their tolerance for a failed transfer, their tolerance for a miscarriage is exactly zero. PGTA is, is there's no question for them. But then we have other patients who, you know, it's not worth the additional cost. It's not the, they, they have a, a much larger tolerance for the journey and what that journey might look like. So it, it's so patient specific and, and depend and dependent from each person on what they it's really important want, to, yeah. to know or to, to, to acknowledge. I yeah, to totally acknowledge, agree absolutely. with you. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, how can it be economical to do PGT? That's a great, that's a really good question. Um, there was a study that came out, I think last year in fertility and sterility, and it was an American study, but basically what they did was looked at the cost benefit analysis for incorporating PGTA into your IVF cycle versus not incorporating it, incorporating it in. And their answer was that if you have more than one embryo, it's cost effective. And now again, it's, it was an American paper, but their rationale was that every transfer, every failed transfer, et cetera, et cetera, costs time and it costs money and there's an emotional cost. And you know, you can, you can make a list of, of all of the costs. Mm -hmm. 
that when they put a monetary value to all of those things, their answer came out to be that it was economical. Again, um, the other side of that scale is what we talked about, which is that patient specific what their values are and what they where they place the emphasis. Uh, I think more and more clinics are starting to adopt um, instead of having these expensive add-ons where you think you know your cost of IVF is going to be X. Well, then you get there and you realize it's not X. It's X plus you know this 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 this. Instead of that sort of model, I think more and more clinics are moving to a model where it's included mm-hmm. and an add-on and. Uh, because we see in the clinics that we work with specifically that they, the, the REIs, the clinic, the patients, they see the advantage and they see how it changes their journey and to be able to offer it in a, um, in a better model, a better model, I guess, um, makes it, makes it feel more accessible. For sure. Absolutely. Thanks for that, Alyssa. Um, this is a really great one because this is something that we do hear a lot. We get questions on this at, at our office and in our support groups. There's so much talk about supplementation, diet, etc. How much of this can really help or increase egg quality or number of viewpoints? Mm, that's a really good question. Um, and to be completely honest, I have not read a study that makes a direct correlation. Now, I am familiar with a lot of the research uh, in sperm and we, we measure something, well not we, but IV, in IVF you can measure something called sperm DNA fragmentation. So that's basically, it's a measure of DNA quality. It's not the same as aneuploidy, but it looks at DNA quality. And there's been a lot of research around the correlation between sperm DNA fragmentation and antioxidant therapy, for example. So taking supplements, taking antioxidants and all of those things. Um, and it's not a strong correlation. So I, you know, I don't, like I said, I'm not aware of any publications that specifically would link any of those things to egg quality or um, embryoploidy. I don't believe there is a a well-known established link, but I do believe that anything you can do to, in general, increase your overall health and well-being, there's no denying that those things have a benefit to your fertility journey. Um, whether it be emotional uh, benefits, whether it be, you know, real, and there are, there are, there are undisputed, well, you know, almost every clinic across Canada has a, a wellness component, an integrative health and wellness component. And those things are, they're extremely valuable and there's a mm-hmm. lot you can do. Um, so I would, I would certainly recommend them as part of your kind of overall strategy and journey. Um, but yeah, I, I'm not, them, and I could be wrong if anyone knows differently. I would love to, to hear that information, but I'm not aware of specific, a specific link to um, ploidy, aneuploidy or euploidy with respect to supplements and things like that. Great. Yeah, we do get that a lot. Um, but I, you know, if you're increasing, you know, and you're, if you're taking care of your body and Absolutely, you're trying yeah. to eat a balanced diet and trying oh, to, yeah. you know, balance emotion and that thing, the stress levels go down. And if those things are reflective, in quality of egg or sperm yeah. then well and, and you know something else that we didn't really talk about but, but we can't forget remember i showed that graphic at the beginning like what does what does ploidy or aneuploidy and euploidy mean for ivf and in that ivf with your euploid embryo you get that kind of 40 to 60 percent plus well there's another component there that makes up you know 40 to 60 percent and that's your endometrium your uterus your health your right so those Absolutely. Specifically, how oh, 100% kind of make up. So, there, it, you know, it's a big picture. Um, PGTA and, and the, you know, the euploid versus aneuploid. Yeah, it's a big part of the picture, but it's not the total picture. So those things that we talked about and your emotional health and well-being, your physical well-being, there's a definitely a place for all of that in your overall success for sure. That's great. Um, another question from Facebook. If you transfer an aneuploid or mosaic embryo, Will it either miscarry if it was a true mosaic or self-correct leading to a healthy live birth? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. So there's a lot of research right now around what what happens to a mosaic. So um, self-correction is one of the models that is out there. Um, 
there's something else called uh, rescue. So if, for example, if it's a monosomy, it can be rescued by a trisomy to become normal. So there's that. And there's a third one, which is just escaping me right now. Um, none of these models have been proven or disproven. So uh, we don't know. The short answer is we don't know how um, embryos uh, become healthy um, babies when they were diagnosed as mosaic. Because there, and there is something that you, that I think that question alluded to a little bit was there's something called true mosaicism. So it's real. It's in the embryo. Um, you know, you could check it five times and you would get the same answer every time. So it's true. It's real. There's something else called technical mosaicism. So technical mosaicism comes from the way it was biopsied. Uh, it could come from things that are happening at your genetic testing lab. It's, it's not real mosaicism. And there's been a lot of studies that are looking at true versus technical. And that's why when we report a mosaic result, we never definitively say it's mosaic. What we say is we see a result that indicates possible mosaicism. Because in the absence, like the only way you could really get that answer, it would be to biopsy, 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 biopsy. You would kill the embryo. We don't want to do that. So we can just report on what we got, that sample we got, the sample we tested, what we see, it indicates possible mosaicism. And are some of them false mosaics? That's one of the arguments that we hear when we go to these scientific conferences and people are reporting all these healthy live births from these transfers of mosaics. Well, were they ever really mosaic? That's a question, it always comes up. Um, were they just euploids that were misdiagnosed? The ones that fail. Were they aneuploids that were misdiagnosed? It's so, I don't want to get into too deep in the weeds here, but there was a couple weeks ago, the first published report of a mosaic baby born from a mosaic embryo. First report, came out of Turkey. The embryo had 30% mosaicism, I believe, for monosomy 20, so it only, sorry, two, monosomy two. It only had one copy of uh, chromosome two in a mosaic, 30% mosaic. And the baby, so in during uh, the pregnancy, the amnio tested positive for a monosomy 2 mosaic. And then when the baby was born, the blood sample from the baby showed, now it was only 2%. So the embryo had been 30, the baby showed two, but the baby appeared and is, seems to be completely healthy and normal. But this is the first report of a known mosaic transfer mm. that showed some mosaicism in the baby. So there's disputing that there is mosaicism is real we are just learning what it means it's just so early in the yeah. science yeah. is so yeah. science is so new yeah, yeah. that's what's and so we, interesting I mean, about this yeah. ivf world or fertility yeah. a lot world. of i do, i mean we we like to get as much feedback as we can from our our clients and our clinics that work with us um we have got some feedback uh most of the mosaic transfers don't result in pregnancy. Um, some do. So, uh, you know, collecting that information, which specific, you know, ones, and so that we're globally collecting all of that data, um, where chromosomes were affected, what was the percent, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But um, we're doing the best we can right now with what we know and what we have. I think we've come a long way in uh, acknowledging and reporting mosaics and giving patients you know, really great genetic counseling, um, letting them make those decisions and guiding them and supporting them through those, those difficult decisions, because I think calling them aneuploid is the wrong decision. And we, we were evolving away from that. Okay. That's very interesting. I've got one here. Uh, this is a patient experience. So mm -hmm. our issue is male factor infertility with a very high fragmentation and we only get mosaic embryos. I thought it was due to the sperm and high DNA fragmentation. Is that correct? Or is it actually due to the egg? That's a great question. Usually, usually mosaic embryos are independent of the sperm and the egg because, so there's two different kinds of genetic errors. One we call meiotic and that's related to the sperm and the egg. The other is called mitotic and mosaicism is usually a mitotic error. And what that means is it's cell division error. So I, I think I alluded to this in the talk, but when you've got your, your egg, it fertilizes and it's two cells, four cells, eight cells, that's happening at a ridiculously fast rate. That's when those mitotic errors happen. Most mosaicism is mitotic in nature. So it's independent of errors in sperm and egg. 
but I do believe, and I'd have to, I don't want to say anything that's not true. I'd have to check my papers on this, but I do think there are some um, mosaic types of mosaicism that can be linked to the sperm and the egg. Um, if that particular patient is interested, maybe they can contact me directly and I can dig up some of that information for them. That's really interesting. That was um, a good question. Yeah. And probably a very helpful answer when you're thinking yeah. it's due to one, um, you know, one partner or one, mm, one egg or yeah. sperm. And yet um, it might, there's a high probability it's not related to that at all. It's actually just the embryo. So there's, it's, yeah, it's the other kind of interesting thing about mosaicism is that it doesn't really seem to be correlated to maternal age. So unlike your meiotic, your, your sperm and your egg aneuploidy, mosaicism doesn't have as good a correlation with maternal age because those mitotic errors, those errors in cell division happen pretty much evenly regardless of your age. Uh, it just so happens though that as you're older, you have more aneuploid embryos in general so, you know, that kind of changes your overall, your overall look, but your mosaicism rate technically, according to most of the published literature, doesn't really uh, correlate to maternal age. Great. So I think that I actually think I have one more question that I had written down. Okay. Um, should I base the, the decision to do a PGTA test on the number of embryos that I have? Okay. That's a really good question. Um, and again, it's really important to ask at your clinic because so we have a course and this is kind of getting into the nitty gritty a little bit, but we have a cost that we charge to a clinic to do the testing. But in fact, the larger part of the cost of PGTA is at your IVF clinic. It's biopsy. It's everything that has to happen around the biopsy. That's a huge part of the cost of PGTA. So I know that there's differences in how clinics charge for PGTA. They might charge um, for, for example, a package of five in a package, and then you can add on to that. So there's many different uh, scenarios. Um, some, and of course, depending on your age, we know that younger, when the younger you are, the, you know, the likelihood of you producing more embryos is greater and the likelihood of them being uh, euploid is greater as well. So there's kind of that factor as well. But what I usually tell people or suggest to people is forget about all that. Think about where you are in this moment. Where are you in your fertility journey? Because I think we get, we tend to get so ultra focused on the moment and on like one goal, like getting pregnant, but you're not thinking about the bigger picture. You're not thinking about how old you are. Um, how many kids do you actually really want? If if you could have as many as you wanted, how many do you really want? Um, you know, ask yourself all these questions. Is time important to you? Or maybe it isn't. Maybe you are younger and you've got lots of time. I mean, you know, there's so many things that each person needs to think about. Um, you know, would a failed transfer uh, be acceptable for you? Are you okay with doing a few transfers before you get pregnant? Um, how do you feel about having a miscarriage? You know, it, those are hard questions and they're really, um, it's, a, it's definitely something, and, and talk, to, talk to people, talk to a genetic counselor, talk to your REI, talk to your nursing team, call us at Access Genomics, you know, reach out to the group at Fertility Matters, talk about these things, because I think the real answer to that question is so specific to each person. I know like we've dealt, we, we test single embryos all the time. These people have one embryo and they wanna know, should I transfer it or not? But I also know that lots of people that have one embryo don't want to know. They just want to try. So it's so, and we have, you know, we've got patients that test 15 embryos. They send us 15 samples. They want to know. Give me all the, give me all the information. They want to, you know, maybe they're younger starting out in their journey. There's, you know, it's so different from person to person. Uh, I think you need to just really have a really tough conversation with yourself, with your partner, with your support network. Um, what's important to you? And I think that's where you get to the answer to that. Yeah. Question. And I think that gives me some ideas for future um, sessions that Fertility Matters can put on to help patients, you know, get more data, maybe dig in a little deeper, connect them with the people that they need to be connecting with to have these conversations to help them figure out, you know, is this, is this for me? Where am I? What questions should I be asking myself? Yeah. Because, 
you know, if you're just starting out and, and you've got to figure out IVF and I ICSI and oh yeah, all of the details, and then someone throws this at you, you know, you're just, there's so many balls to juggle. And so yeah. I'm going that's, to. So on that point though, you're not alone. You're not alone. No. You've got access to so many wonderful resources in Canada. Um, you know, there and, and reach out. Don't, don't, uh, don't struggle on your own. No. Reach, ask for help. Um, you know, if you call Access Genomics, you're going to get a live person and we're going to try to help you. And if we can't help you, we're going to connect you with the counselor. And Absolutely. you know, that's, it's, we, so we, we feel so, and I know that at Fertility Matters, you're, you're so passionate about the same thing and just, we're all, you know, we're all here for you. Yeah. So if you have more questions about, um, you know, specific, specific questions about your own journey, please reach out to Alyssa at Absolutely. Access Genomics. If you need her contact information, uh, we've linked them uh, to the, the posts in this event in uh, Infertility Matters on our Facebook page, but you can reach out to us in private message. We can send along um, the contact information for access. That would be great. Alyssa, thank you so much for your time today. I have been, I have learned so much. You know, I know some things and I've learned a lot today. So thank you. And I'm sure that the other people watching have really um, gotten a better understanding of something that can be very complex and like you said, personal. And so I hope that the information that everybody learned today helps you make a better decision about your reproductive health, the choices that you're making on your family building journey. Um, Absolutely. So on behalf of Fertility Matters, thank you for being here. Thank you for spending the last hour with us. And don't forget, it's Canadian Infertility Awareness Week. We are jam-packed with information sessions live with fertility experts from across Canada um, and some from the United States um, coming to you live wherever you are. Check back on our Facebook page for the event details and we'll see you in another hour, we've got another session happening. So thank you, Alyssa. We'll be in touch. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. Thanks, Carolyn. Bye. Thank you.